and thank you, Lord, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit guiding our steps in this world of darkness. Thank you, Father. We thank you for the light of the truth that is taking us in your will to a glorious destination. Day by day, we're always grateful for your instruction, for your guidance. Father, be thou exalted in Jesus' name. Tonight, again, we are gathered with high expectation. I ask that you will do what only you can do among us. You will instruct us. You will encourage us. You will rebuke us. You will correct us. You will equip us. And you will empower us. Lord, we ask that we will assess your wisdom tonight to live a victorious life on the earth. In the name of Jesus. Great Holy Spirit, be free in this place. Do the things that only you can do. Help us to know your will. Help us to know your way. Blessed, O Lord, be your holy name. We give you praise. We give you glory. Online, on ground, let there be an unforgettable encounter tonight. To the glory of your name and to our blessing. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Let's be seated. Tonight, it is a privilege to be in the presence of God again. And I want you to set your heart because God is very serious, committed. That's why you must also be taking yourself seriously. And committed to receive the blessings that will be coming from the word of God. Now, tonight, I'm going to continue in our series of teachings of Sermon of Jesus Christ on the Mount. And in our last Bible study, we were looking at Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 to 11. That's the passage we were studying in our last Bible study. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 to 11. I'm going to read. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a statue? Or will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Praise God. Now, we are looking at verse 7, I mean very specifically. And if I will refresh your memory, we're looking at the danger of not seeking God in prayer. The danger of not seeking God in prayer. For every child of God, for every believer, may I establish it today that it is dangerous for you not to seek God in prayer. You won't be able to, like, to survive the onslaught of the enemy and you won't be able to live successfully on the earth if you do not develop the habit, the anointed habit of seeking God in prayer. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? So it is dangerous. And basically, if you look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, I told you that there are three dimensional meaning of prayer according to that verse. 
the Bible says, ask and it shall be given you. So prayer is a critical privilege for asking God. The privilege we have to ask God about anything is the privilege of prayer. The second part, the Bible says, seek and ye shall find. That's the part we're still dealing with. So prayer, on the other hand, is a critical privilege for seeking God. Is that okay? Critical privilege for seeking God. And I want you to take note, we seek God for two basic reasons. Number one, we seek God primarily to know him. We seek him primarily to know him. That reason must necessarily be your basic reason for seeking God. Did you hear that? You seek God primarily to do what? To know him. In knowing him, we develop fellowship with him. We share fellowship with his grace. We enter into intimacy with the Father. That must be your basic purpose of seeking God. If that is not the basic reason of seeking God, that is, we seek him to know him. Our seeking will be perverted. Our seeking will be upside down. We will not be able to benefit from the advantage of seeking God. So, the first reason, the foundational reason why we seek God is to know him. You, you know the person you are seeking for. To know him, to develop to, to develop intimacy with God, to have relationship with him so that you don't have to wait until there is crisis before you begin to look around for God. You already have a habit of seeking God, basically to know him, to know his ways, to know his word, to understand his will. The second reason for seeking God is to experience his power. This is where the issue of solution comes. This is where the issue of answer to our problems comes. We seek him to experience his power. There is nothing that is troubling us that the power of God cannot take care of. There are times that there are issues in life that are bigger than you, bigger than your power, you know, you are face to face with a mountain that you don't have power to respond to. We seek God for help. We seek him for power. We seek him for his intervention. Did you get what I'm saying now? There are questions in our life sometimes that we might not be able to answer. But we seek him to get answers from him. But listen to me. If you have not been seeking God to know him, you won't get the benefit of experiencing his power. That's the mistake that most people are making today. They don't have anything to do with God until they run into crisis. They don't know God. They don't have relationship with God. They don't have fellowship with God. They are not intimate with God until they run into problems. And the moment they run into problem, they begin to seek God in a panicky mode. Just looking for solution. That's a perverted way. That's not the plan of God. Are you hearing me now? You don't look for God only when you are in trouble. You don't pray only when you are in danger. You must seek God basically to know him. There must be an ongoing relationship fellowship. You must know God and God must know you as you seek him every day in the place of prayer ever before there is any problem at all. When problem now come, you are qualified to experience his power. So if the first one is not in place, the second one cannot happen. That is, if you don't seek God regularly to know him, you are not likely to experience his power. God is not a consultant. 
that you come to once in a while. And after your problem is solved, you abandon him and go and do and go your way. God does not want to be part of our life. He doesn't want to be part of our life. He wants to be the reason for our living. He wants to be the source of our life. Are you hearing me now? It is weak believers and ignorant Christians that are always looking for divine intervention. Correct Christian that understand the place of developing fellowship and relationship with God, always seek for divine involvement. When God is involved from the beginning, it will definitely be part of your life. It will definitely handle the problems. It will definitely supply the answers. It will definitely give you the solution. But most people are running up and down today only when they have problems. And when there is no problems, they have no ongoing relationship with God. Don't forget that. It's very, very important. So, I was talking about the danger of not seeking God in prayer. And you remember there were two dangers. The first one, the danger of ignorance. This is the danger that affects the unbelievers, the sinners, those who do not know God. They don't seek God because they are ignorant of the true God, of the God of the Bible, and they are ignorant of the provisions he has made. So, what do they do? They begin to seek worthless idols. You know all the idols? They begin to seek them for help. And many times, as a result of ignorance, they sell themselves, spirit, soul, and body, to Satan through a covenant with the devil but through these idols. Unbelievers always look for idols because they are ignorant. They don't seek God because they are ignorant of the true God and they are ignorant of his provision. Sinners and unbelievers always seek help. They seek healing. They seek power. They seek protection. They seek prosperity and many other things from evil spirit, from Satan, basically through ignorance. They are ignorant of God. They are ignorant of his provision. And they are ignorant of his power. And as a result of this ignorance, beloved, they are severely judged and punished. Because the devil has no free gift. A lot of them are being punished. A lot of them are under yoke. Because they do not seek God because of ignorance. The second danger is the danger of unbelief. If you remember, this is the danger that seriously affects many believers today. A lot of people that are in church today or that claim to be believers today have problems with unbelief. They don't seek God because of unbelief. A lot of people don't seek God in prayer, especially believers, because of unbelief. Are you getting what I'm saying? In the, the problem of believers is unbelief. And let me tell you, if you have problem believing God and believing his word, you are not worthy to be called a believer. Somebody say a believer. Say it louder. A believer is a person that believes in God. The main assignment, the main responsibility of a believer is not just to pray, it's not just to fast, but to believe. To believe God, to believe Jesus Christ, to believe the word of God, to have faith in the promises of God, to believe that whatever is happening, what God has said is what will happen. 
that it doesn't matter the contrary uh, nature of experiences in the world. The counsel of the Lord shall stand. That quality, the spiritual quality of believing. Even if you don't have any serious reason to do so. Is what qualifies a believer to be called a believer. Are you hearing me now? But most people that call themselves believers today have problems believing God. That's why they don't see this. They pray, but they don't believe in the prayer. And that's why they still look for other things. They are not restful. They are not peaceful in the presence of the Father. They are not, uh, they are not satisfied with God, you know, because of unbelief. Many times when we pray, we begin to, do you, think, do you mean God will answer this prayer? Do you mean with all that I'm seeing, do you mean God can do this? Do you mean God can do this? Only God, how many, only God knows how many people are secretly asking themselves in the church. Even though they come to church that, do you think God can handle this? Do you think this will happen? Do you think this promise will be fulfilled? They have problems believing. I want to pray for you today that you all the issues of unbelief will be dealt with in your life. I can't hear your amen. Because the Bible says in Hebrews eleven six that without what? Faith. It is what? Impossible. It is impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a what? A rewarder of those that did genesis give. You don't have to see God before you believe God. Are you getting what I'm saying? You don't have to see any special manifestation before you know that he will answer your prayer. Even if what you are seeing looks contrary to what you are believing for, you don't need any other evidence to believe that it's going to answer your prayer. You believe it will answer because he said so. That's all you need to believe. Did he say so? If the answer is yes, you just believe. It doesn't matter what is happening. Now, if you don't develop that exceptional quality of believing in God and in his word, in spite of what you see, you will not be qualified to be called a believer. A believer believes. So the believers of today have problems with unbelief. And it's a danger that doesn't make them seek God. In their unbelief, number one, they conclude that prayer alone is not sufficient to give them what they are looking for. Do you know some people believe that prayer, prayer alone is not sufficient? They believe that something else must be done apart from prayer to get solution. They believe that something else must be done. He that help himself is the one that God helped. Have you heard of that statement before? Prayer looks too simple for them to solve their problem. Seeking God in prayer, quoting the promises, believing God looks too simple for them. They believe that is that all? Ah, something must be done. And that's why they are looking for solution elsewhere. Even after they have supposedly prayed. In one word, they are saying that God is not enough. Did you hear that? They are saying that God is not enough. And beloved, God is enough. I don't know what you are saying. But I know that God is enough. God is sufficient for me. God is all I need. His word and promises are all I need. Number two, in their unbelief, they believe that praying to God is not fast enough to bring the needed solution or the needed intervention. Somehow, somehow, the, the believers of these days have a deception to think that man or Satan is faster than God. You know, after you have prayed, you need the quality of patience for answer to manifest. How many of you know that? It's not every prayer that God will answer immediately 
or that the answer will manifest immediately. There are some prayers we have prayed 10 years ago that answers are coming today. The truth of the matter is this. God is the decider of time and season. Are you hearing me now? The Bible says he makes all things beautiful in his time. In the right time for that thing, and in the right time in God's divine schedule. You are not the one that will determine the timing. God determines. So, many times when we pray, and the answer didn't show immediately, the devil come to deceive you that the God, has not, God, God has not heard your prayer. And many of us will begin to tell God again and again and again and again, as if God is deaf. God is not deaf. He heard you the first time. You engage the quality of patience and see God walk on your behalf. Did you hear that now? Our God is not a deaf idol. He has ears. He created ears. He who created ears, can you not hear? He who created hand, can you not say? Talk to me. He who created mouth, can you not speak? So, most of these people believe that God is not fast enough. So, they rather find their way with men. And they get into other self-help efforts. Including satanic or even demonic help in these last days. A lot of people get into, get engaged with false prophets, strange source, just because they want it fast, fast. To them, they believe God is not fast. <laughs> they believe God delays. Are you hearing me now? But God never delays. I, I remember I showed you Matthew 7, 7. The Bible says, ask the word and it shall be given you. Seek and what? And ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. This does not look like a God that delays. Don't you think so? Once you ask, it shall be given. Hello? It shall, even though you may not have seen the manifestation immediately, but you know, once you ask, it shall, once you submit your petition, it is passed. It is approved. So you must be expectantly waiting for manifestation. Seek and you will find. Knock and it shall. The Bible didn't say it will. It said it shall be opened. Our God does not delay. And many people, they believe that prayer is not working like us of old. This is the danger of unbelief why many believers are not seeking the Lord. Or why they are not seeking the Lord effectively. The devil successfully plants this deception into their heart. That God does not answer everybody in our day. Except the few lucky ones. Like the special apostle, the special pastors. They are the one that God answered, the special prophet. So they get their problem solved anyhow. And they ascribe it to God. They believe that God denies. Beloved, God does not deny. He answers like us of old. Matthew chapter 7, verse 8 says, What? For everyone. Somebody say everyone. Did he say special apostle? Did he say special prophet? Did he say pastor? Is there any titled mention to qualify you for access into the presence of God? No. The only thing is that you must be born again. You must be a child of God. He said for everyone that asketh you receive it. And he that seeketh findeth and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. You don't need any intermediary. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Beware today of the danger of unbelief. Now, today what I want, I'll just continue in that flow. The first thing I'll do today is to share with you five basic truths that will help you to escape the danger of not seeking God in prayers. Five basic truths 
that will help you to escape the dangers of not seeking God in prayer. This truth will help you to escape the danger of ignorance. And this truth will help you to escape the danger of unbelief. And when you understand this truth, and you begin to practice this truth, beloved, your seeking of God will be more effective. Your seeking of God will be more powerful. Your seeking of God will be more purposeful. And your seeking of God will be more profitable. Did you get what I just said? When you understand these five truths that will help you to escape the danger of not seeking God, and you begin to apply these five truths, your seeking of God in prayers will become more purposeful, more powerful, more profitable, and more effective. Number one, as a believer in God through Christ, Your seeking of any blessing must be from only the true God. As a believer in God through Jesus Christ, your seeking of any blessing must be from the only true God. Let me explain what I mean by that. As you live in this world, you will need different blessings from time to time. Yes or no? Is there anybody who doesn't have a need? You don't need anything. Is there anybody like that? Talk to me. You discover that from time to time, we will always need something. Whatever blessing you need at any point in time, Maybe protection, maybe preservation, maybe whatever. You will need something. But if you are going to escape the danger of not seeking God, you must come to a place where you can settle once and for all that anything I will ever need as long as I live on this earth, I will get it only from the, from the one true God. Hello, somebody. It's a commitment that you must make. To it. And it's, it's a commitment that you must continue in it tonight. It's a matter of covenant. That whatever I will ever need, as long as I live on the earth, I am going to get it only from the true God of the Bible. Set to it before problems begin to come. Get into that covenant with God before crisis will show up. That I'm not going to get any blessing from any strange source. Until you get into that kind of commitment, your Christianity is not reliable. Especially in these last days. Until you get into that kind of commitment with God, your Christianity is not predictable. If you have not taken that decision once and for all, that anything I will ever need as long as I live on the surface of this earth, I'm never going to get it from any other source except from the one true God. I'm not going to seek for the help of man. I'm not going to engage the help of the devil. I'm not going to get any blessing from demonic sources. I'm going to get whatever I need on this earth only from God. And I will be satisfied with whatever he gives. If you have not taken that decision, you will collapse under, under crisis. You will collapse under pressure. Because when problem comes, the devil will mount pressure. Your flesh will mount pressure. 
Your friends will mount pressure. Your family will mount pressure. Pre your pressure will be piling up from different places to seek for help somewhere else. But if you get into this truth, you will become stable. I'm never going to get anything that God is not giving. If you have not done that, and if you have not taken that, your Christianity is not reliable. I'm telling you. A lot of people today that say they are believers are getting their so-called blessing from strange sources. From occultic sources. Only God knows. Only God knows how many people are giving testimony today that their testimony didn't come from God. Only God knows how many people are celebrating answer today that they are, the answer they are celebrating is not a triumph of faith. The blessing they are rejoicing over, they didn't get it from God. They knew the corners they, 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 they caught. They knew the consultations they make. They knew the strange practices they got themselves into. But they just come to say God has done it. Beloved, I see the Holy Spirit telling us tonight that for your Christianity to really start, especially in these last days, you must take a decision once and for all. Tonight, that you are never going to get any blessing that God is not giving you. Otherwise, you are in the danger of not seeking God. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Don't have any blessing in your life that God is not giving you. Don't have any blessing in your life that you can't trace back to God. That you can't trace back to the triumph of prayer. The triumph of faith. Don't have any blessing in your life that God that you cannot say that God gave me this. Are you hearing me now? Because once you have any blessing in your life that you cannot conveniently say that I got this from God, the devil has the right to take over your life. He will have claims. You can't be keeping his blessing and be keeping him out of your life. You can't get anything from Satan and say he shouldn't control your life. Beloved, take that decision tonight. It's a truth. You must come to that place that I'm never going to get any blessing no matter how much I need it from strange source. I will get all the needed blessings from God. Beloved, what God cannot do is not in existence. There is nothing God cannot do. Don't let the devil deceive you. This is the era of deception that the devil will tell you, get it anyhow and come and celebrate in church. Get it anyhow. No, only God help those who help themselves and come and give testimony in church. It's not every testimony that is acceptable to God. In fact, some testimonies will send many people to hellfire. Be honest with God. Be faithful with God. Don't waste your time. Don't deceive yourself. That God doesn't have any party mixture. God can't take the glory for what the devil has given you. Because you cannot give his glory to the devil. Sort it out once and for all tonight that as a believer in God, through Christ, whatever blessing I will need, I will always get it from the only true God. Beloved, the only true God is referred to as the God of heaven. Did you hear that? He's referred to as the God of heaven. The only true God is referred to as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The only true God is referred to as our Father in heaven. Don't ever contemplate any alternative. Any alternative to God. 
regardless of the temptation. I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 3. That scripture is a stabilizing scripture. I read verses 20 and 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, Now unto him that is able. Tell somebody, my God is able. You know, there are many people that are willing, but they are not able. There are many willing people in the world, but they are not able. But our God is not just willing, more than willing, he's able. He has ability on his side. Don't let anybody deceive you. Down to him that is able to do how much? Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Even the things you are thinking that you are not even began to talk about. God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. I hope you are following me tonight. Now look at Romans chapter 11. I will read verses 33 to 36. You have to follow me very closely. Romans chapter 11 verses 33 to 36. The Bible says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. That's the God you serve. His ways are past finding out. For who had known the mind of the Lord? Or who had been his counselor? Or who had first given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him again. Now listen to this verse 36. For of him and through him and to him are what? Are all things. To whom be glory forever. Did you get that? So that's the first truth. Let it set in your heart. I'm never going to get any blessing. No matter the temptation. No matter the pressure. I'm never going to get any blessing from other source apart from God. I'm never going to submit to the deception of going from one prophet to the other, looking for solution. Only God knows how many, how many people in church today are wandering from one place to the other, looking for one prophet or the other, looking for people that will, that will do strange soap for them, that will take them to junction to bath, and all kind of strange things and strange practices because they are desperately looking for solution. Set to it before the day of temptation that I will never get any other thing from any other source. They said God. Even if God, if, even if God can't do it, I, it, it means I don't need it. Did you hear that? Assuming God cannot do it, then it means I don't need it. I'm not, if God can't do it, who else will do it? Is it the devil? Is it man? But the truth is this. With God, all things are possible. <laughs> Number two. It dishonors God. When any child of God forsake him, and look up to Satan or Satan's agent for help. It dishonors God. When any child of God forsake God in a time of crisis and problem and begin to look up unto the devil and the agent of the devil for help. More than your desperation more than the solution you seriously need. The moment you forsake your God and look up to devil or his agent for help, you are dishonoring God. Did you hear that? You are simply saying that your God 
cannot do it. You are simply saying that your God is powerless. The God of the Bible is a God that wants to be honored. He's a God that wants to be glorified. He's not a God that, that wants to be dishonored. God is very, very sensitive to honor. And God hates dishonor. Beloved, never do anything that will amount to dishonoring God. Can you imagine a man who is very rich? Let's say a billionaire. Whose son is begging for money on the street? Is he, by begging for money, is he honoring his dad? What is he doing to his dad? Dishonoring him. Just walking up to somebody and say, can you give me 2,000 there? You know all the billionaires in Nigeria. I don't want to mention them. Assuming one of their children. Just walk, as they, just walk up to you and say, can you give me 2,000 there? And you know him as the son of this billionaire. Won't you be embarrassed? Won't you be embarrassed? What will you say? What was the first thing you would say? Ah, are you not so and so? The son of so and so? In fact, the fact that he is begging you for money is a confirmation that my father is useless. That my father cannot give me. It is dishonoring. How much more the God of heaven? Are you hearing me now? He honors God for you to look up to him. And look away from the devil. And look away from the agent of the devil. He honors God for you to be patient and wait for him. Not minding the intimidations. Not minding the threats or the pressures around. Nothing honors God more than that. For you to say, well, yes, there are problems. Yes, this storm is gathering. Yet, there is reality of intimidation threat to my life. But I will wait upon my God. Nothing is more honorable to God than that. It is that honor that will provoke his answer in your life. Hello, somebody. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall what? Shall renew their strength. There is no alternative to God, beloved. Stop having any thought in your heart as if there is an alternative to God. <clears throat> Stop having any feelings that make you feel that if God didn't work, I, 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 can, I can do this. Say to it in your heart that God will always work. Or tell somebody God will always work. God is always reliable. God can never fail. Don't have any alternative plan. Assuming God didn't work. Assuming God failed. This is what I will do. God can't fail. Number three. Looking up to Satan. Looking up to the agent of the devil. Or even looking up to ordinary man. Because some people are. They have replaced God with men in their life. Say, as long as my father is there. So, the presence of his father has blinded him from seeing God. Most women that have responsible husbands don't develop their faith. They say, my husband will buy it for me. So, they don't develop their faith. They don't develop their relationship with God. The presence of their husband has blinded their eyes from seeing God. Some that have children that are responsible, are taking care of them, don't, don't develop their relationship with God again. So any small thing, they look unto their children. Any small thing, they look unto their husband. Any small thing, they look unto their wife. They look unto their friend. They look unto them. people that come from rich family. Many of them are blinded. They don't have relationship with God. Because they were, ah, my family is there. They will always take care of me. Beloved, don't walk that road. Don't let anybody replace God in your life. Did you hear that? 
In fact, anybody that is replacing God in your life, you are putting the life of that person in danger. Because if you do it for too long, God might come after that person and kill him to expose your foolishness. Did you hear what I just said? So, looking up to Satan, looking up to the agent of Satan, or even looking up to ordinary men for help, do you know what he does? It exalts it exalt the power of Satan. It exalts the power of the agent of Satan and the power of men above the power of God in your life. <clears throat> Once you begin to look up to the devil for solution, for help, or you are looking up to the agent of the devil for help, or you are looking up to man, your fellow man, for help, you are exalting the power of the devil. You are exalting the power of the agent of the devil. And you are exalting the power of man above the power of God in your life. You are making the power of God useless in your life. God is powerful, but you determine how much of his power will be working in your life. By your faith in him. Ordinarily nothing can rival the power of God. But you can limit or destroy the power of God completely in your life. When you are looking up to Satan. Or looking up to the agent of the devil. Or looking up to a, a human being. Instead of looking up to God. The more you look up to God, the more you exalt his power in your life. How many of you want the power of God in your life? Can I see your hand? You want the power of God in your life? Look up to him every time. The more you look up to God, the more you exalt his power in your life. But when you look up to Satan, you exalt the power of Satan above the power of God. When you look up to the agent of Satan, you exalt the power of that agent of Satan above the power of God. When you look up to man, you are going to exalt the power of man above the power of God in your life. And God cannot struggle with anybody. It's either he has you 100% or he doesn't have you at all. Did you get what I'm saying now? Every time you look up to God, you are exalting the power of God in your life. But when you look up to any other thing apart from God, you are simply destroying the power of God in your life. You are limiting the power of God in your life. Don't walk that road. Number four, looking up to Satan, a man for help, belittles God in your heart. Looking up to Satan or man for help instead of looking up to God in any situation, it belittles God in your heart. How big is God in your heart? How big is God in your heart? The size of God in your heart is more important to God than the size of God in your mouth. The size of God in your heart is more important than what you are saying about God in your mouth. God doesn't respond to what you say about him in your mouth. He responds to how big he is in your heart. Of course, you know there are many people that are saying many big things about God. But God is very, very small in their heart. Did you hear what I say? God always responds to how big he is in your heart. Don't be a person that God is big in his mouth and God is small in his heart. It is the size of God in your heart that will attract God to you. If you believe that God is bigger than your problem, then your problem will give way. 
But many times we believe that our problem is bigger than God. It's only that we are not saying it. God is not carried away by what you say about him. God is attracted to you by how, much, how big he is in your heart. There are many people that know the many names of God. They know the big names of God. And they even give God very big, big names. That when they are rehearsing it, when they are calling it, your head will be swelling up. You will think that is how God is big in their heart. Are you hearing me now? Once you look up to Satan, or you look up to man for help, instead of seeking God, you belittle God in your heart. And many of us have been belittling God, belittling God, until God is no longer in your heart again. Now when there is any crisis, the first thing you think about is how to help yourself. Not how to call on God. God is no more in your heart. The first thing you think of, who do, who do I call? Which button will I press? Which Baba will I visit? Which prophet will I go to? Which apostle will, will give me prophecy? Instead of calling on God. If you get to that level, God is no longer in your heart. And when God is not in your heart, God is not in your life. Don't walk that road. The Bible says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, which maketh the heavens and the earth. As you continue to look up to God, God becomes big and big and big in your heart. Did you hear what I'm saying now? Beloved, when you belittle God in your heart, on the other way, when you magnify the devil, when you magnify man, because once you belittle God, it means you are magnifying another thing. Yes or no? You know what? You are worse than an atheist. You are worse than an atheist. An atheist said there is no God. But if you belittle God by magnifying the devil and magnifying man, you are worse than an atheist. Number five. Are we together? The danger and damnation of a believer, so-called, who is looking up to man or Satan instead of seeking God is a million times greater than the pain or the problem he or she is trying to overcome. The danger and the damnation of a believer who is looking up to man or Satan instead of seeking God the danger that will come upon him, the destruction and the damnation that will come upon such believer, in quote, is a million times greater than the problem he's trying to overcome. It's much more than the pain he's trying to overcome. Did you get what I'm saying now? Every time you look unto the devil or man, instead of seeking God, You are bringing more destruction into your life that will be bigger than the problem that you are trying to overcome. How many of you understand that point? Hello? When there's a problem, and as a result of that problem, instead of looking unto God, seeking God in prayers, you are looking unto the devil, you are looking unto man, the destruction you will bring upon your life will be more than the problem you are trying to solve. Don't do that. Don't get yourself into a greater problem than you are trying to solve. 
Don't get yourself into greater destruction than the problem you are trying to solve. Many people, when they look unto the devil and look unto men, instead of seeking God, they bring greater destruction upon their life, greater damnation, and greater danger upon their life, more than the problem they are trying to solve. Shortly before I go tonight, let me give you what I call instructive scriptures about the danger of not seeking God in prayers. Instructive scriptures. I'd like you to follow me. Instructive what? Scriptures about the danger of not seeking God. These scriptures that we are going to read together tell us that it is seriously dangerous if you form the habit of not seeking God. Beloved, seeking God in prayer must be your constant habit. You remember I told you when I started that the first reason why we seek God is to do what? To do what? To know him. And you must be knowing him every day. You, may be, you must be a seeker of God on a daily basis. You must have sought God today in prayer. If you have not sought God today, you have wasted today. You must seek God every day. It is your fundamental spiritual duty. Not only wait until you get into trouble or wait until the day of temptation before you now begin to run. In fact, when you seek God to a level, you, you will know him. You will know him so much that the devil cannot harass you with problem. You'll be so confident my God will show up. That is a confidence that comes from knowing God. That's a confidence that overcomes. Hello, somebody. It's a confidence that tells you that no matter what the devil is telling you about God, you are never going to be shaken because you know this God well enough. Ah, it's a confidence that is not bothered by the circumstances of life. Because you are too sure of this God. Because it's a God you seek every day and you know every day. It's not only when there is problem you now begin to run around run around, going to play. In fact, when people are panicking, they don't even know where to go. And many times they go to wrong places just because they are panicking. Panic is a sign that you don't know God. The Bible said, they that know their God shall be strong and they shall do what? Exploit. May you know God. And the only way to know God is to seek him. Tell somebody, seek God in prayers daily. Seek him daily. Say it again, seek him daily. When you form the habit of seeking God daily, you won't even get into the danger of not seeking God at all. But let me show you these scriptures. Second Chronicles. Let's go there first. Second Chronicles. I'm reading from chapter 16, from verse 1 to 13. Second Chronicles chapter 16, from verse 1 to 13. Follow me very quickly. In the sixth and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Asa is the king of Judah and he is one of the kings that the Bible said did that which is good in the sight of God. In the beginning of his life, he loved God. He served God. He sought God. He trusted God. He believed God. He served God with all his heart. And the Bible reputed that he did that which is good in the sight of God. Now, a time come in the, 30, 30, in the 30th year of his reign, in the 36 years of his reign, 
which means he has served God for how many years now? At least for 36 years. He has done the will of God at least for 36 years. In the 36 years of his reign, Basha, who is the king of Israel, came up and waged war against Judah. Let's look at his response. Are we together? Verse 2. Then Asa brought out silver and gold. You see his response. Thinking that money can bring solution. Placing money before God. Placing money before seeking God. Trusting in money more than the power of God. Do you know there are many people that believe that there is, there is nothing money cannot do? In fact, they believe more in the power of money more than the power of God. They believe as much as I have money, I don't need to call upon God. I don't need to believe God. I don't need to trust God. It's like they trust in chariot. They trust in horses. And beloved, they will fall. It is those that trust in the Lord, not in the power of money. How can you imagine somebody who has trusted God for 36 years now, as a king, now have problem in the 36 years of his life, and the first reaction is to bring out money? not to seek the Lord. What a grievous mistake. He brought out silver and gold out of the treasure of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent it to Ben-Hadad king of Syria that dwelt at Damascus, saying, there is a link between me and thee as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go! Break thy league with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. And Ben Hadad hearkened unto the king Asa, and set the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. And they smote Ejon, and Dan, and Abelmai, and all the strong cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass, when Basha had it, that he left off the building of Ramah, and let his work cease. Look, you know what? Let me explain to you. You know, he brought out money when he asked problem. Are you with me? And then he went to pay money to another king of Syria and say, break your league with this king of Israel and come and help me. He didn't seek the Lord. He didn't trust the Lord. He believed that I can bribe my way to victory. I can, I can overcome this problem without God. <clears throat> what an error. Now let's follow. Verse what now? Verse 6. Then Asad, the king, took all Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah, and the timber thereof, wherewith Basha was building, and he built there with Geba and Mizpah. And at that time, listen to this. <clears throat> Hananiah. Hananiah the seer came to Asa king of Judah. And said unto him, listen to this. Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria. And not relied on the Lord thy God. Therefore is the host of the king of Syria escape out of thy hand. You know the meaning? You will never overcome them. Because you trust the Syrians to help you more than the God of Israel. More than your God. You left your God. You replaced your God with the Syrians. You will never be able to overcome them. They will always overcome you. May your enemy not overcome you. Many times when the enemy is overcoming you, you have left God. You believe in men more than God. You believe in money more than God. You believe in your influence and popularity more than God. Oh, never trust yourself. Trust in the Lord. The Bible says some trust in horses, some trust in chariot, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are falling, but we are risen and we stand upright. May that be your experience in the name of Jesus. You know, the story of Asa is very painful to me personally. Because he's somebody that knew God before. 36 years on the throne, he was following God. I wonder, what now happened? 
That tells you there is nothing, there's nobody the devil cannot derail. You must take a decision that I'm going to trust God for the rest of my life. Is there anybody taking that decision here tonight? That I will trust God. I will trust God. I won't place anything above God. God will be my first call. God will be my middle call. God will be my last call. God will be everything to me. Let that be your decision. So that you can escape the danger of not seeking God. Now look at verse 8. Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because thou didst rely on the Lord, it delivered them into thy hand. Do you understand that? These were the nations that had waged war against Judah before this time. They were bigger and stronger than this king of Israel. That time you were trusting God and God delivered you. What changed now? Beloved, what changed now? Why are you moving from pillar to post looking for false prophet? What changed now? Why do you believe in the devil? What changed now? What changed now? I pray you will not experience negative change. I can't hear your amen. amen. Verse 9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them who, whose heart is perfect toward him. You see now, God is strong for those whose heart is what? Is perfect. Those that God is big in their heart. Not the people that believe money more than God. And then, hearing thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth, thou shalt have wars. Ha! Ah, ah, ha! What a dangerous pronouncement. The prophet said, Asa has done foolish. Do you know it is foolishness to trust in another power. It is foolishness to seek help from another source. It is foolishness for you to have a blessing in your life that you can't trace to God. And the Bible says it's not only foolish. From now, war, you will always have wars. Now look at this. What would you have expected from Asa after that pronouncement? Talk to me. Ordinarily, what would you have expected? As somebody that knew the Lord before, you would have expected him to just fall down and say, God, have mercy on me. You would have expected him to behave like David, his forefathers, and say, I've sinned against the Lord. Have mercy on me. Do you know what he did? Let's look at what he did. Verse 10. Then Asa was wrought with the seer. When you see anybody angry against the person that is telling him the truth of the word of God, that person has left God. When you are angry against your pastor that is telling you the truth of the word of God, you, there is no more God in your life. This prophet has come with to tell him the truth. He was angry against the prophet. He would have been happy if the prophet was telling him lies. When you are happy when people lie to you, God is no longer in your life. Don't get into that position. Then as I was wrought with the seer and put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the apostasy, the bastard deed that has come upon Asa? He put the prophet of God into prison because he told him the truth. He had left God completely. And then verse 11. And behold the art of Asa. First and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa in the thirtieth and ninth year of his reign. When did he begin to mess up? Thirty-six years. God waited for him for how many years to repair? For three years. God was waiting for him. Maybe he will change. Maybe he will come back to me. Maybe he will trust me now. Maybe he will repent. For three years. He did not change. He was getting worse. So in the 39th year. Of his reign. Was diseased in his feet. Until his disease was exceeding great. 
Yet, in his disease, he sought not the Lord, but to the physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. Can you imagine the story of a backsliding king? Can you imagine the sorry story, the terrible story, the negative story of somebody who started well, who ended badly? I want to pray for you. You will not end badly. You will end well. You will not tell story with Christianity. You will not say when I used to know God. You will not say when I used to pray. When I used to go to church, when I used to read the Bible, ah, that will not be your story in Jesus' name. May you go from glory to glory, from strength to strength, loving God and getting stronger, believing God and trusting Him more on a daily basis. In the name of Jesus. Why did he have disease in his feet? Not because of any problem in his body, well, because he has left God. And if, you know, when God used, when God sent his voice to you and you didn't hear, he allowed sickness to come. And once you can't hear, you will die. That was what happened to Asa. God sent prophet to him. He didn't hear. He jailed the prophet. For three years, God waited. He fell into disease. God allowed disease now. Even in that disease, he didn't seek the Lord. He was so stubborn. He believed in the doctors more than God. Even when you are going to the hospital, you must believe God. Because doctors make mistakes. They are human beings. Your hope must not be in doctors. Even as you go to the hospital, your hope must be in God. Are you hearing me now? Don't stop praying because you have gone to the doctor. Don't get yourself to a point that the doctor says, sorry, we can't help you again. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? So he never sought God at all. Even one would have expected that in his sickness he would seek God. He didn't seek God. He continued with his problem. He continued not seeking God. And then he died at the 41st year of his life. He was not supposed to die like that. You will not end like Asa. I want you to write this quickly. Number one, these are lessons from that story. It is better to seek God than man in all circumstances. It is better to seek God than man in all circumstances. Number two, it is a grievous error to leave God and seek man. Don't commit that mistake. It is a grievous error to leave God and seek man. Number three. What grace will do? Gold or money cannot do it. What grace will do? Gold or money cannot do it. So depend upon the grace of God every time. More than money. Don't let your confidence be rooted in money. Let your confidence be rooted in the grace of God. Number four. Problem that appear physical have a spiritual root. Problem that appear physical. Why was As why did Asa develop disease? In the physical, you will see disease, isn't it? But what is the root of that disease? It's because he has problems with God. So problems that appear physical have a spiritual root. So making man your first point of call is a grievous mistake. Did you get that? Very instructive, beloved. 
I want you to write down this second scripture. I won't be able to read it here. You, read, you, get, you read it when you get back home. First Samuel chapter 28, verse 3 to 8. First Samuel chapter 28, verse 3 to 8. It's the story of Saul. First Samuel chapter 28, verse 3 to 8. It is the story of Saul, the first king in Israel. He had left God. Of course, you know the story, isn't it? He has left God. And now there is a problem. The Philistines have come upon him. After he has left God, after he has stopped seeking God for many years, now that he now has a problem, he now thought, let me seek God. <clears throat> the Bible says he called upon God. He was seeking for God through Urim, through the prophet, through dreams, through vision. But you know what? God didn't answer him. You know why? His heart was not right with God. It was not genuine. It was not penitent. It was only looking for solution. It was not looking for relationship. A little somebody. And when God did he answer him, you know what he did? He said they should get somebody from a diviner from him. Somebody a necromancer. Somebody that can help him bring out Samuel from the dead. And they got him the witch at Endor. And you remember when he was with God in the beginning of his kingdom. He killed all the witches in Israel. Now that he has left that God, he went back to where he started. It will not be ill with you. I'm praying for you. You didn't hear me. It will not be ill with you. He became ill for Saul. He went back to what he has destroyed. And because he knows that the step he's taking is wrong, he had to disguise. Is that not an acceptance that I know that what I'm doing is wrong? He had to disguise. He had to disguise. There are many people that know that what they are doing is wrong, but they will still do it. Many people will say, I've gone too far. It's better to go far and come back to the right than to go far and get lost. And so he disguised. Of course, you know the woman, the witch, identified him. God never answered him. You know the story. You know what ended his life. The next day, he went to the battle and he was killed. I want you to write this down. Number one, seek God consistently as a lifestyle habit. Seek God consistently as a lifestyle habit. Is that okay? Seek God consistently as a lifestyle habit. Don't let anybody tell you you go to church too much. In fact, tell them I have not even started. Seek him consistently. Number two, seek God primarily to build relationship with him. Seek God primarily to build relationship with him. Don't have the habit of making God your spare tire when you run into a problem. Don't be the person that will be looking for God only when he is in trouble. That was why God did the answer Saul. Number three. Don't seek God conditionally. Seek him unconditionally. It was because Saul had problem with the Philistines. That was why he was thinking of seeking God. As some people, when they don't, when they have, when, when they, if they don't have problem, they will never come to church. They will never read their, they will never pray. 
I used to know somebody years ago. Anytime I see him in church, I know he's in trouble. Hello, somebody. Praise God. That I used to know a brother years ago. Anytime he showed up in church, he's in trouble. And I'm always right. Anytime I see him in church, I know he's in trouble. Because he doesn't come to church except he's in trouble. There are funny people like that. Don't be one of them. Seek God unconditionally. Don't seek him conditionally. And then, the last one, write this down. Sort out relational issues before with God. Sort out relational issues with God before expecting to profit from seeking God. Sort out relational issues with God before expecting to profit from seeking God. Every relational issue you have with God, sort it out first before expecting to profit from seeking God. You cannot undermine your relationship with God and expect God to answer you. You cannot despise your relationship with God and expect God to answer you. As far as God is concerned, the solution is not what is, prior, what is, what is critical to him. It is your relationship with him. But many of us make the mistake of the solution bigger than your relationship. I want you to write these scriptures. Are we together? Second Kings chapter 1 verse 2 to 4. Second Kings chapter 1 verse 2 to 4 and verse 16 to 17. Second Kings chapter 1 verse 2 to 4 and verse 16 to 17. You can read it up when you get home. Second Kings chapter 1 verse 2 to 4 and verse 16 to 17. Then Isaiah chapter 8 verses 19 and 20. The Bible said to the law and to the testimony, if they do not according to this law, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8, 19 and 20. Then write Isaiah chapter 31 verse 1 to 3. The Bible declared there, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. Woe, woe, woe. Egypt is darkness. The devil. Woe to them who go down. At this level of your Christianity, no false prophet should be able to deceive you again. Woe! If we say we are born again, it means we have left something. Abi, must we go back to those things we have left? God forbid. I will stay together. Write Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 21. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 21. And then write Second Chronicles chapter 25 verse 14 to 16. And verse 20. Second Chronicles chapter 25 verse 14 to 16 and verse 20. Second Chronicles chapter 25, verse 14 to 16, and verse 20. Are you there? Now, this last one, I'm compelled to read it because I want to compare this story with the story of Asa. And then we pray. You remember the story of Asa? It started well, it ended badly. But let's look at this. Second Chronicles chapter 33. I like everyone to open our Bible. Open your Bible, Second Chronicles chapter 33. I will read from verse 1 to 13. I want everyone to open his or Bible because this story is very instructive and it is, I want to compare this story with the story of Asa so that you can make your choice. Which one do you want to do? Second Chronicles chapter what? 33 from verse 1 to 13. Manasseh was 12 years old 
when he began to reign. What a young man. What a young boy. So, And he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. What a long reign. Listen to this. But did that which was what? Evil in the sight of the Lord. Like unto the abomination of the hidden. Whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Beloved, Manasseh was the son of Hezekiah. Manasseh was born in the 15 extra years that God gave to Hezekiah. How many of you remember the story of Hezekiah? That God gave him 15 extra years. It is in those 15 extra years that he gave back to this Manasseh. And it's Manasseh that became king after Hezekiah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of God. Not ordinary evil. Serious evil. Look at verse 2. I mean verse 3. For he built again the high places which Ezekiah, his father, has broken down. All the places of idolatry that his father, Ezekiah, had broken down. You know what he did? He built it again. May we not have a bastard as a son. He built it again. And he reared up altars for Balim. And made grooves and worship all the hosts of heaven and serve them. He worship the sun, he worship the stars, he worship the moon, all the hosts of heaven, and he was serving them. Instead of serving God. He did opposite of what his father Isaiah did. Verse 4. Also he built altars in the house of the Lord. Whereof the Lord has said in Jerusalem shall my name be forever. He had, so, he had audacity to get into the temple and build altar of idol. In the temple of the Lord. Can you see that demonic audacity? And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven. In the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his children to pass through the fire. That is the greatest sign of idolatry. In those days. He caused his children to pass through the fire. You know the meaning? He sacrificed his children to the idol. That's how terrible he is. I mean he was. In the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times. He used enchantment. He used witchcraft. He was, a, he was a witch. He was a witchcraft. He was a wizard. He was a witch. He, he, he walked with the devil so terribly. Hello? And dealt with a familiar spirit. And with wizard. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord. To provoke him to anger. And he set a carved image. The idol which he had made. In the house of God. Ha! Idolatry in the temple. Azumi was doing it outside. He brought it to the church. Of which God has said to David. And to Solomon his son. In this house in Jerusalem. Will I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel. Will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more. Remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the hidden. Can you imagine when the Bible says somebody is worse than the hidden? Hello? Are you following me? It was terrible. Whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Look at verse 10. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hack him. He rejected the voice of God just like Asa rejected the voice of God, but you know he doesn't have the history of godliness like Asa did. Yes or no? This one is, a, is, is the brother of the devil. Asa <laughs> served God for 36 years. <laughs> Asa started well, but this one started terribly bad. I hope you are comparing the two now. Wherefore, the Lord brought upon them. Because God has spoken to them, they didn't listen. So God brought upon them the captain of the host of the king of Assyria. Now listen to this. We took Manasseh among the tongues. 
I'm bound with fetters. I carried it to Babylon. <laughs> Praise God. They use hook to, to hook him. Just like a fish. And they dethroned him. And took him to Babylon. This man understand the language of affliction. This man understand the right thing to do when he's in trouble. You know what he did? Verse 12. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. Did you hear that? One would have expected, do, which, which of them between Asa and Manasseh would you have expected to seek God in trouble? Asa, because he knew God before. But you know what? Even in his disease, he didn't see God. But this one, he didn't know God at all. But when he ran into trouble, he knew that there is a God in heaven. He, for, he forsook the witchcraft, he forsook the, the enchantment, he forsook all these occultic practices. He sought the Lord his God and did what? And humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him and he was entreated of him and had his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Look up, everybody. Manasseh started very terribly bad. He ended well. Asa started wonderfully well. He ended badly. I pray for you. You will not end bad. The Bible said, the first shall become last. And the last shall become first. Whether we like it or not, it is a scriptural prophecy. It will come to pass. But you will be the one to make sure that you don't come last. That you don't come last. That you don't turn back from following God. There will be shock on the day of judgment. Many people that you think are children of God, that started very well, would go to hell because they ended badly. I pray for you, you will end well. Rise up on your feet and I want you to begin to speak to God. You tell him tonight, I will not serve any foreign God. It's more than a song. It is a commitment. I hope somebody is hearing tonight. It's a covenant. I will not serve any foreign God. I will serve God. Nothing will happen that will make me to look for help from strange places. Nothing will happen that will make me to go to the devil for help. Nothing will happen that will make me to stop following God. Oh Lord, help me. Oh Lord, help me. I choose to serve you to the end. I will seek you all the time. I will seek you all the days of my life. I will not turn my back against you. I will not replace you with money. I will not replace you with popularity. I will not replace you with anything. Oh God, you will have your place in my life. You will always take your place in my life. I will not stop following you no matter what. I will serve no foreign God. Oh, beloved, open your mouth and pray. It must be a lifetime commitment. I'm not going to get anything from the devil. I choose to stay with God. Not for one month. Not for one year. All through my life. I will not go back to my vomit. I will not go back to my vomit. I will not be like a pig that goes back to the mire. I will not pull down the truth that I already know. Oh, oh Lord, help me. My end will be better than my beginning. It will not be ill with me. I will not be like Asa. Oh, beloved, pray tonight. 
He that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. It's not about how you started. It's much more about how you ended. I will not end with the devil. Saul ended with the devil. He went back to, to look for help from, this, from the witches he had been killing before. He messed up his life. Lord, I receive grace tonight. Never to bow down to pressure. Never to bow down to pressure. Open your mouth and pray tonight.